All right, 10 o'clock, okay. We're doing reasonably good. Okay, all that ends in Oma is not necessarily benign. Okay, so take melanoma. If you just say that, you know, and you'd say, well, that must be a benign tumor of melanocytes. No, it's a malignant melanoma. Lymphoma, say, well, that must be a benign tumor of the lymph nodes. Okay, no, it's a malignant tumor. So all that ends in Oma is not necessarily malignant. Also, all that ends in Oma is not necessarily a neoplasm. And I'm showing you the two good examples of that. This is called a hamartoma. A hamartoma is an overgrowth of tissue that's normally present in that area. And the one that you all know is a bronchial hamartoma. Basically, all this is is cartilage. It's benign cartilage, and it presents as a solitary coin lesion in the lung, which makes you wonder about whether it's a granuloma or something of that nature, but it's a hamartoma. So they're not a neoplasm. The polyp of Puch-Jager syndrome is a hamartoma. It's not even a neoplasm. That's why there is no really increased risk for colon cancer in Puch-Jager syndrome, because the polyps are not, are not neoplasms. The hyperplastic polyp, which is the most common polyp in the entire GI tract, is a hamartoma. So it's not even a neoplasm. Okay. All right. This one here is a, a section of stomach, and in the, uh, in the muscle wall of the stomach is benign pancreatic tissue. Does that belong there, yes or no? No. So when you have benign tissue in a place that shouldn't be, that's called a chorostoma, or another name, heterotopic rest, either one of them. Okay. Meckel's diverticulum is a classic example. I mean, what's the most common complication of the Meckel's diverticulum? Bleeding. From what? Well, usually either gastric mucosa that's ulcerated or sometimes pancreatic tissue causing the ulceration. Should gastric mucosa be in a Meckel's diverticulum? I don't think so because that's in a small bowel. I mean, that's roughly two feet from the ileal sequel valve. That's an example of a heterotopic rest. Should pancreatic tissue be in it? No. But it is. So that's another good example of a heterotopic rest. So uh, hamartomas be, uh, are, are uh, non-neoplastic lesions and therefore have no potential for uh, producing cancer. Okay, so let's talk about the big word M or the big word C, uh, cancer. You know, one of the big misconceptions is that, you know, increased mitotic rate meets cancer. No. I mean, we have lots of cells in our body that are mitosing right now. That doesn't mean we have cancer. Mitoses are part of the growth of the cell cycle. The thing that really makes a mitosis malignant is this. See, that's not the normal, uh, that's not the normal mitotic uh, uh, configuration. This, has, this, has, uh, this probably has it's for a 4N cell. This has more uh, chromosomes in it than normal. When you have an atypical mitotic spindle, that's cancer. So an increase in mitotic rate doesn't really mean anything. But when you have atypical mitotic spindles, that usually relating to the fact that they're aneuploid, they have more than the, the normal 46 chromosomes, they might have 63 or whatever, that's malignant. Okay, also remember that the sine qua non, that means the key thing that determines whether something is malignant is its ability to metastasize. A couple other things I have listed down there for malignant cells, they have usually a longer cell cycle than the cell from which they derived. You do need to, you do need to know about that. This is a memorization thing, but they throw it every now and then. They say, how many doubling times does it take before you get a tumor that you can detect clinically? The answer is 30. 30 doubling times means 30 times going through the cell cycle. And you get a tumor that's about uh, one centimeter in size, okay, 10 to the minus 9 in mass, okay? So 30 doubling times is something you want to remember is that when, it's when a tumor can become clinically detectable. Uh, malignant cells are immortal. I mean, so they really can't die. They can live forever in tissue. In fact, we use Burkitt's lymphoma cells in, um, in, uh, as a test for immune complexes, okay? So we can grow Burkitt's lymphoma cells in culture. They're immortal. They don't like each other, so, okay? They kind of don't stick to each other. They lack adhesion. That's important because if they, if they were stuck to each other, then how are they going to infiltrate tissue? So they lack adhesion. They don't like to stick to each other. They so leave me alone. I want to just, I want to burrow through this tissue myself. Okay, I don't want anyone impeding me. Okay. They have very, very system, simple biochemical systems, usually anaerobic metabolism. They have lots of enzymes. They, they love, they have to have proteases because that's one of what's going to, they're going to use to break through the tissue, proteases. 
okay? Uh, they're going to have to have collagenases to break through that basement membrane, so they have to have those kinds of enzymes to do things like that, okay? Those are the key things that, uh, that make a malignant cell malignant. Metastasis. Three, three modes of metastasis, lymphatic, hematogenous, seeding. Now, this is a big misconception here, too. Now, remember, we have carcinomas and we have sarcomas. How do carcinomas usually initially metastasize? Lymph nodes. They drain to their regional lymph nodes. So for breast cancer, that's the axillary nodes. They can also go to the internal mammaries if they want. For colon cancer, it would be the nodes right around it. For esophageal cancer, the nodes right around it. So they go to the local lymph nodes. What part of the lymph node? The subcapsular sinus. Okay, and this is showing... Uh, this is showing uh, McKenzie cells in a lymphatic here, and then showing here a lymph node that has been partially replaced by a malignant tumor. Okay? Malignant tumor. So they first go to lymph nodes as a rule. But don't forget, if they can get through that lymph node and go into the efferent lymphatics, and that drains into the thoracic duct, which comes into the subclavian, then they're hematogenous. So don't think that carcinomas are not hematogenous spread. Of course they are. And when they're hematogenous, that means they've already got through the lymph nodes. And so when they're hematogenous is when they can go to bone and liver and other places. Okay? So don't forget that. You know, carcinomas can be hematogenous. But usually first they go to the lymph nodes. In a sense, that's good because if we can feel that lymph node by clinical exam, we can maybe pick up that cancer at an early stage. Unlike sarcomas, which don't like going to lymph nodes. They just like going right through blood vessels right there, and they, and they usually characteristically metastasize hematogenously. That's why the, the lungs and the bone are such common sites for sarcomas. Okay? They don't usually like going to lymph nodes. So those would be a little bit worse, wouldn't they, because they go hematogenous right off the bat. Okay, they don't give us any hint that they're there because they don't like going to lymph nodes. Now, the practical, what practicality of that is, is that if you have, let's say, an angiosarcoma of the breast, would you do a radical dissection of the axilla? No. Why? Because an angiosarcoma doesn't go to lymph nodes. You do a simple mastectomy. If it was a breast cancer, though, a carcinoma, you would take the, you know, the breast or you do a lumpectomy and you'd sample a couple lymph nodes or do a complete dissection. Okay, that would be part of it because carcinomas go there. Okay, you understand? So there's practicality in knowing that. Okay, so this is lymphatic spread. You can see it to a lymph node here. This is tumor in a vessel. Now, I, I know my pathologist friend knows I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to pass this off as sarcoma, and he knows that it ain't. But um, at any rate, sarcomas like to go in a blood vessel. This is a blood vessel, and here's tumor in a blood vessel. Actually, this is a carcinoma that doesn't know it is. It's a follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. There are some carcinomas that say, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't always like to go to lymph nodes. I want to go to the hematogenous node. Okay? And so one classic one is the follicular cancer of the thyroid. It doesn't like to go to lymph nodes. It thinks it's a sarcoma. Okay? It's kind of a transvestite thing, whatever you call something like that. Okay? Uh, renal adenocarcinoma, you know, likes to invade the renal vein. I mean, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, I like it. Why do you like it? I just like it. Okay? Okay, and it determines your prognosis, too. In fact, I've seen uh, renal vein, I've seen it go all the way up the renal vein and up the interior vena cava. <laughs> I mean, it likes it so much. Hepatocellular cellular carcinoma is always in vague vessels. So there's an exception to every rule I'm saying. Okay, but in general, carcinomas first go to lymph nodes and then have the potential for becoming hematogenous. Sarcomas usually don't like lymph nodes and go directly hematogenous, which makes them dangerous. There are some sarcomas that do go to lymph nodes, but you don't need to know them. Seeding. Seeding is a concept of like seeding. The farmer throws out seed, and wherever that seed lands, it expects it to go and burrow into the dirt, and out comes the plant. Okay? And so when we have cancers that are in cavities, the classic example of very, very in cancer, they have a tendency of seeding, little malignant implants. Okay? See, most ovarian cancers are surface-derived cancers. So that means they derive from the lining around the ovaries. And so you can see it's very easy for them to seed, throw out malignant implants of small little pieces of cancer and they go over the omentum and into the Douglas pouch of Douglas, okay, uh, which is uh, just posterior to the uterus and just anterior to the rectum. We can feel that by rectal exam. The pouch of Douglas 
is uh, to a woman as the prostate gland is to a man. When you do a rectal on a man, you press forward, that's the prostate you're feeling. When you do a rectal on a woman, you press forward, you're feeling the rectal pouch of Douglas, which we'll show you when we do GYN. Okay. Very important area because it's the most dependent part of a woman's pelvis. That's where things like unclotted blood go and a ruptured ectopic. That's where endometrial implants go and endometriosis. That's where seeding goes in ovarian cancers. The pouch of Douglas, a very important anatomic location. Been on many, many boards. So seeding, and this is an example of an ovarian carcinoma that's seeded to the amentum. Okay, so it actually can invade. Uh, you can actually see it in the pleural cavity. For example, if you have a perfectly located lung cancer, it can get to the pleura, it can see through the pleural cavity. Okay, and you can see the little implants all along. Glioblastoma multiforme, the most common primary malignancy of the brain in adults, can seed into the spinal fluid and implant the entire spinal cord. So can a medulloblastoma in a little child do the same thing. Okay, so seeding, that's the concept. So we have, so we have uh, lymphatic, hematogenous, and seeding as the three mechanisms for metastasis. Okay, now I want to uh, make sure you understand this concept. And that is, if they ask you about, you know, most common cancers and stuff like that, could you please, when they ask something like that, first they ask yourself the question, is metastasis more common than the primary cancer? In most cases, metastasis is the most common cancer in an organ. Okay, not a primary cancer. I'll give you an exception to that. Renal adenocarcinoma, that is the most common one, not metastasis to it. But when we talk about lung, most common cancer, the most common cancer in the lungs is metastasis, and unfortunately it's breast cancer. That's the most common, that's the most common cancer in the lung, is breast cancer. So that means that women uh, are more likely to, when they, uh, to, uh, to get, uh, have metastasis to the lung. Bone, most common cancer in bone is not multiple myeloma, osteogenic cell coma. No, 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 metastasis. And unfortunately, again, the most common cancer that metastasizes the bone is breast. That's because that stinking Batson system, the B-A-T-S-O-N system, it's a venous complex that goes from the base of the skull down, the, down to the sacrum. It has no valves in it, and, and the little tributaries uh, communicate with the vena cava, and they also, little tributaries go right into the vertebral bodies. And then they collect all together on the inside, right around the spinal cord area, and go back up. So there's a horrible little system there. And so you take a woman with a breast cancer, for example. She's maybe got a little plug of tumor in an intercostal vein. She goes and picks something off the ground, and she dislodges that little piece of cancer from the vein to the vena cava into the bats and plexus in the vertebral body. Three months later, she's complaining of low back pain. And all of a sudden, she's stage four cancer just by bending over, stinking bats and system. The most common bone metastasized to is the vertebral column. The second most common is the lumbar area, the vertebral column. The second most common area is the, the head of the femur. Any good pathologist knows that an old person gets a femoral head remover, I always take a section to it because it thinks metastasized to it. Woman, breast cancer. I've seen breast cancer in the femoral head that they thought was, was related to degenerative arthritis. It was breast cancer that caused the problem. Okay. So remember that. Most common, what do you think the most common organ metastasized to is? Lymph nodes. That one you actually could figure out because carcinomas are more common than sarcomas. Carcinomas like to go to lymph nodes. That would be the most common metastasis too. This one will get you all. Ready? What's the most common cancer of liver? Metastasis, what do you think the most common primary is? You want to say colon, don't you? It's not. It's, colon, it's uh, lung. Most common cancer metastasizing to liver is lung. Don't believe me? Look in Sabison's sex book surgery. They have this big table with a hundred something thousand autopsies and by far and away lung beat colon, lung beat colon as the most common uh, cancer metastasizing to liver. Second would be colon because of the portal vein drainage. Okay, here's another one. Where would a testicular cancer metastasize to first, please? The periodic lymph nodes. Why not the, why not the inguinal lymph nodes? Because remember, it derived from the abdomen and then descended into there. See, those are questions they ask in anatomy, guys. Okay, they, they, they take a clinical bent on, on a question that uh, related to knowing that the, oh, the, uh, the testicles are originally from, from the abdominal cavity and then it just descended into the testicles. So if they're malignant, like a seminoma, 
first place is not the inguinal notes, the first place would be the periodic notes from whence they came. Okay, what about that left supraclavicular node? What do you think about with that? Metastasis, that's called Virchow's node, most common primary. Stomach. There you go. They don't say Virchow's node, they just say there's a mass in the left supraclavicular node. They do not give actual names to these things, which is, ah, your cows. And someone with weight loss and epigastric distress, duh, stomach cancer, metastasizing. I want you to look at this, please. This is a radionuclide scan, which is the best test for looking for bone nets. Everywhere you see black except that urine down over there is metastasis in this poor woman with breast cancer. If this doesn't solidify in your head, that the most common bone metastasizes to is the vertebral column. I don't know what will. This entire vertebral column is full of cancer. And there's your pelvic uh, uh, brocurtal a bit. Notice you're going to get a little bit now a chromioclavicular area too. Now we have metastases that are lytic. We have metastases that are blastic. Lytic means they, they, they break bone down. Okay. You all know that multiple myeloma has these nice punched out lesions. You want to know why? All malignant plasma cells have interleukin-1 in them. You already know what interleukin-1 has got another name for it, osteoclast activating factor. So you already know the mechanism for that. Okay, so we have lytic. And so we can get pathologic fractures from that. We can also get, if they're lytic, what metabolic abnormality? Hypercalcemia. There you go. Okay. Then we have some that they go in the bone and induce an osteoblastic response. Take this, for example. I mean, that's bone. You can see it's dense, okay? So I want you to tell me what enzyme would be elevated in this patient. Alkaline phosphatase. And I want you to tell me, is this a male or a female? Play odds. Male. With what cancer? Prostate cancer, which is almost always osteoblastic. And because it's making bone, it's going to release alkaline phosphatase. Most common location for metastasis is a lumbar vertebra, actually. Want the board question? Got an 80-year-old man with lower, lower lumbar pain with point tenderness. Okay? Well, they said, what's your first step in management? And they said bone scan. They said PSA, prostate-specific antigen. They said uh, uh, trans uh, rectal ultrasound. What's your answer? Your finger. Rectal exam was the answer. Why? That'd be stage 4 disease, which means that definitely the prostate is going to be palpable, so that'd be the simplest, easiest thing to do. Put your finger in there and check you know, that's it. And of course, you are going to do a PSA. You are going to do a scan. But the first step in management is the obvious, the cheapest, your finger. Put something on it. A cut. Okay. I can't tell you how many people pick PSA, prostate-specific antigen. Bad error. Or radionuclide bone scan to make sure that's not lumbar metastasis. That's great. You're going to be doing that. But you should have done a rectal before. You with me? Good. These are lytic metastases. You can almost see that. Look at how that vertebra is collapsed. See? So you have lucencies, lucencies, you know, where there's an absence of bone with lytic metastases, whereas in plastic you'll have entities on a regular x-ray. Okay? All right. Now, just a, a point. This is a CT scan of the liver. And you notice there's multiple defects. I want you to remember this and do not forget this. This is a general statement. If you see a growth specimen, an x-ray of something, I don't care what, CT, MRI, a growth, whatever, it's got multiple lesions in it, it's metastasis for your intents and purposes. Don't pick abscess, you know, or whatever. It's metastasis. Don't pick primary cancer. Primary cancers usually aren't like this. Usually they're within one area, maybe another area, but not all over the place. So if you see any growth specimen, any x-ray with multiple lesions in it, it's metastasis. Just find out where in that, that choice that deals with metastasis. Understand? Do not pick anything benign, ever. All right, here's just examples of other places metastasized to. There's the brain. What do you think the most common cancer brain is? Metastasis. What's the most common cancer killer in men and women? Lung cancer. Therefore, what do you think is the most common primary site? Poor cancer in the brain. Primary lung. There you go. Okay, this is liver. You already know that's also lung. Here's lung. What's the most common cancer in the lung? Metastasis. And what's the most common primary? Breast. Okay. This is the adrenal gland. What do you think the most common tumor metastasizing to adrenal is? Lung. That's why they always do CTs of the hyalur lymph nodes 
and they have the adrenal glands and the staging of all lung cancers because they go so commonly to adrenal glands. Okay, and of course this is bone, this is lytic or blastic? It's blastic, so what is the most likely cause? Prostate cancer, there you go. All right. Stains. Well, I already mentioned one, uh, Desmond. I remember uh, intermediate filaments. Uh, Desmond is a wonderful stain for muscle. And that's why uh, they use that when they think they have a muscle tumor, like an embryo or rhabdomyosarcoma, they do that. We have stains for keratin. Most carcinomas have uh, keratin in them, and so we stain for that. We have stains for just about everything. And we use them in helping us identify different kinds of tumors. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on that. Electron microscopy is not used very commonly in pathology. Only uh, sometimes when we don't have no idea what the thing is. The stains don't work, all the different special things and all that don't work. We sometimes have to do electron microscopy and see if that will help us. Okay? Uh, sometimes, like for example, if we had an opera tumor, what would we see? Neural secretory granules. If we had a uh, histiocytic tumor, like let's say histiocytosis X, letter of seaweeds, hand shula Christian, what would we see? Berbic granules. Okay, because they're characteristic. And what would be the cluster designation uh, that we would see? CD1, there you go. Okay, if we had muscle, what would we see? We'd see actin and myosin filaments. Okay, if it was a, if it was a vascular malignancy, we'd see weibel pilot bodies. These are the structures that have von Willebrand's factor in them. We can actually see those things, so we know that things of, is of, uh, of endothelial origin. Are you with me? This is how they get at histology, guys. Histology is the least important thing on the exam. But the way they ask the questions is in relationship to how we use histology in making diagnoses in pathology. That's how they use it. And don't forget the gap junctions. You've got to know all the gap junctions. You know which ones communicate, which ones don't, and all that stuff. Okay, now this is the most important part right here, oncogenesis. I'm going to make this as simple as I can. Why? Because... I can't understand it all because it's just so much to it. But I think what I've got is more than enough for this board. Okay, I'm going to be very simple on this. First of all, whenever you study something, always get the big picture first. Don't start delving into little picky facts. That's why you'll never end up with a knowledge of anything. But I can always tell when you don't know how to study. You open up a, a book and you start underlining right off the bat. You have no idea how to study. That's not the way you study because you're already starting to get, get picky facts. The way you study is to get the big picture first. That means you don't underline anything. You just read it through fast at the level of a novel, or a little slower than a novel. You get the big picture. And the big picture to me is definitions. Knowing the definitions of the different things. That's the big picture. Then you go back and study for, you know, the mechanisms and stuff like that. Got to have a big picture. No big picture, you're screwed. So what would be a big picture, for example, tissue hypoxia? Big picture would be ischemia, hypoxemia, Hemoglobin-related problems, uh, um, uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, uh, that. That's the big picture. <laughs> okay? You don't know that? You're screwed. You don't know tissue hypoxia. Okay. Got to do big pictures first. So here's the big picture. The way we're going to do this by, I don't know if you understand, for some of you may not have in your countries, and probably you're lucky, fraternities and sororities. This country and the colleges, they have all these things. It's the way you're going to remember oncogenesis. Okay, so if I was going to go and want to get into a fraternity in college, I have to be initiated. So the first step in malignancy is initiation. And that means mutation. It has to be mutation. There's always kinds of mutation. We'll learn them in a second. That's the first part of going into a fraternity or sorority. You have to go through initiation, do stupid things. But for oncogenesis, it's a mutation. Okay? We like you. You did all the stupid things. Please come into our fraternity. Okay? So now you'll be promoted. Okay? You are promoted into the, uh, into the fraternity. So promotion is the second step of oncogenesis. That's where you make multiple copies of that mutation. Remember from going into the G1 or the S phase? You've got a mutation in there, and you start going through that cell cycle? Bad news. You're making multiple copies of it. That's, that's uh, promotion. Okay? And then you're in this fraternity, and you are really, are really, really good. So we want to make you president. We want to make you in charge of the whole thing. So you progressed in that fraternity or that sorority, and now you're a leader. And that's the third step in oncogenesis is progression. And what that means is that different, different kinds of cancer cells are, have different functions. 
It's, it's basically a community of malignant cells that has one purpose, to kill you. Okay? Okay, you can just see this big collection. It says, okay, who wants to stay where you are? Me. Okay, you're the couch potato. You stay here. Who wants to invade right where you are? Me. Okay, so they're given special things to be able to invade. Who wants to go to the lung? Me. Okay, and they're given special things with receptors to hone in on the lung. Yep, that's the way it works. I mean, they, all, they even have some, who wants to resist the chemotherapy they're going to throw at us? Me. Okay, and so they have those that can actually, you know, resist the chemotherapy before you even throw it at them. That's why culturing cancer cells is the big thing now, and they're kind of doing like they do with, with bacteria. You know, they put the sensitivity plates, the curvy bower. You can do that with malignant cells now. They do it with melanomas. They take your tumor, they put it in the, uh, in, the, in the culture medium, and they can put discs that have different chemotherapy agents in and see if it kills them. And then they can give you the exact chemotherapy agent that will kill it. That's where it's going. But unfortunately, they can't do that for every cancer. Otherwise, that would be the best way. This is called progression. So could you please tell me what the stages are in order, please? What's the first stage? Initiation. What does that mean? Mutation. Okay, what's the next step? Promotion. What does that mean? Dividing it, making multiple copies. Then what's the last stage? Progression. What does that mean? This is subspecializing. Okay. Good. That's the big picture. Now let's go and start, start getting into um, the finer points. Well, we have two sets of genes that are involved in cancer. One, we have those that are involved in the growth process. Those that are involved with cell cycle related things. We've already been introduced to some of those, okay? Um, then we have those kinds of genes that kind of like monitor things, suppress things. So we have groups of cells that are involved in the normal growth cycle. And then we have other types of genes that are involved in suppression. Those are called suppressor genes, okay? Those are the two big sets of genes. Now, you all know, and you should have had this in cell biology already. Let's take things that are involved in uh, trying to get a cell to divide. Well, first of all, we have growth factors. Good examples, epidermal-derived growth factor. Okay? Well, there are certain what they call proto-oncogenes. These are cancer. These are genes are cancer genes, but normally, when they haven't been activated, they actually serve a normal function in a normal growth process. That's why they're called proto-oncogenes. When they become oncogenes, that means that they're bad. They are cancer-producing genes. Um, and so we have certain uh, proto-oncogenes that code for growth factors. A good example is CIS, S-I-S. It's a proto-oncogene. Its only function is to make the growth factors. All growth factors have to hook into a receptor. Just like all hormones have to hook into a receptor, Okay, insulin hooks into a tyrosine kinase receptor on adipose and muscle. Everything has to hook into some receptor. Okay, so we have certain proto-oncogenes whose main job is to make receptors. So the ERB2, the class of one for breast cancer, is an example of, a, of an oncogene, a proto-oncogene who codes for a receptor. Okay, codes for a receptor. Another one's RET, the RET, which is in men's syndromes, men 1, men 2. Okay, men 2A, 2B. I just love it, men 2B. Uh, they have that, you know, those are involved in the receptors, not the growth hormone, the receptor for it. That's their specialty. Uh, we have to send a message. We have to send a message to the nucleus. And so then we have a whole other set of proto-oncogenes whose, whose job is to send the message, it's kind of like the telegraph system. We have some of them that are located in the actual cell membrane. You already know about that. That's the RAS proto-oncogene whose job, its messenger is a GTP. It sends a phosphorylated protein message. And so it's a cell membrane located messenger system. Then we have the ABL, ABL uh, proto-oncogene, who uh, lives in the cytosol, very close to the membrane. And it also uh, is involved in, uh, in, uh, in messages uh, as well. Um, so we have to have some messenger system. Okay, who is the messenger sent to? Well, it's sent to a group of proto-oncogenes that are in the nucleus. And once that message is sent to them, then they uh, stimulate nuclear transcription of that message. In other words, the cell divides and makes whatever it is it's supposed to make. The classic proto-oncogenes there are the MYC proto-oncogenes. We have NMYC and CMYC. Okay, NMYC and CMYC. One's for neuroblastoma and the other one's for Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay, so in review... The, uh, the things, the, the proto-oncogenes involved in a normal cell, cell process involve those that make growth factors. 
make uh, growth uh, receptors for those factors, uh, those that make that uh, send messages. A lot of the messages are uh, uh, phosphorylated proteins, so that's why tyrosine kinase is oftentimes attached to the receptor right off the bat. So as soon as, let's say, insulin, for example, hooks into a receptor on an adipose, it activates tyrosine kinase. We're right on the receptor, so it's right, located actually right there, which makes a phosphorylated product, which goes and does the nucleus to go divide and all that stuff, and it goes to the Golgi apparatus and says, okay, guys, where's glute fours? And so the old glute fours come out, that's glucose transport units, kind of like golf carts, and those little, those little glute fours from the Golgi apparatus go to the cell membrane of the adipose, and they're the receptors for glucose. Okay, so that's how that works. Okay, so the messages go to nuclear transcribers in the nucleus, and those are the MIC oncogenes. Okay. Now, who's controlling these dudes? The suppressor genes. We already mentioned the two most important ones, the RB suppressor gene and the P53. There are others. There are other suppressor genes, but those are the most important ones. They kind of control the cell cycle. Remember, they try to keep it in the G1 phase so that everything can be cleaned up a little bit before it goes into the S phase and gets initiated. Got me so far? Got to be as simple as possible. Okay. Now. How do we initiate a cell? Mutations, for example. What are the mechanisms of the mutations? Not a whole lot of them, actually. Probably the most common one is a point mutation. Okay? Now, if you don't know what that is, uh, usually in biochemistry when they do the DNA stuff, and Reichenbach probably is the one that does that, uh, when they do that kind of stuff, they talk about point mutations in, a, in, the, uh, in those little trinucleotide things. It could be uh, substituting adenine for thymidine or something like that. Okay, so point mutations. In fact, the two most important genes involved in cancer are both uh, involve point mutations. That's the P53 suppressor gene is a point mutation that knocks that one off. And then the, the RAS oncogene is a point mutation. That was a board question. They had groups of genes and they said, which ones are by point mutation? Okay, and that was the P53. All suppressor genes, by the way, are all point mutations. That's real easy. But the other dudes, the proto-oncogenes, have a couple of different ones. Okay. So RAS and P53. So one thing's point mutation. That's probably the most common. Another one that you'll understand more when you get your DNA lectures, if you haven't had those already, is what is called uh, amplification. It's kind of like PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It just kind of makes multiple copies of, uh, of, um, of something. That's called amplification. The ERB2 uh, and breast cancer is a, a uh, amplification uh, type of a system. So that's, that's a different kind of mutation. But here's the one you really want to remember, translocation. Translocation. That's taking some place and putting it in another place. Okay? Right now, you've all been translocated. Is this the usual place where you are? No. Okay? So you've been translocated over here. Okay? You have another place that you live. Is that correct? All right. But unfortunately, in translocation, you get translocated, you can't go back. You stay. <laughs> Do you want to stay here? Say no. No. Okay, all right. Now, some of the classic translocations, every one of them that's important is in your, in your notes. Um, then here's the big one. is uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia is translocation of the ABLA. That's non-receptor tyrosine kinase activity. ABLA from chromosome 9 to 22. And there it fuses with the break cluster region to form this fusion gene. And then all of a sudden, because it has that tyrosine kinase activity, it sends a message. And all of a sudden, those cells, those stem cells just keep on dividing. Okay, we have chronic myelogenous leukemia, of course, chromosome 22 with that fusion gene is called Philadelphia chromosome. There you go. And then we have a cancer uh, associated with epstein barr virus. That translocates the MYC nuclear transcriber gene, nuclear transcriber gene from chromosome 8, and it sticks it on the chromosome 14. It don't like it there. And so you end up getting Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay? Burkitt's lymphoma. Now, if you want to understand the epstein barr virus relationship, it's quite simple, actually. Remember we said there's a receptor for epstein barr virus in all of our B cells? Anybody remember what it's called? CD21? Do you know what it does when it hooks into that receptor? It causes B cells to become plasma cells and make antibody. They are unbelievable stimulators of antibody synthesis. So cytomegalovirus. 
And because of the fact that it stimulates the B cell to become plasma cells, there's a lot of divisions that occur there, guys. And so isn't it make sense that the more a cell divides, the more something bad can happen to it. Okay, so here's this EBV virus going, boom, 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 A14. All of a sudden, there's a translocation of the MYC oncogene from 8 to 14. And the next thing you know, you're making multiple copies of that progression, and you've got yourself Burgess lymphoma. So that's how EBV predisposes to that particular cancer. It just increases the mitotic rate, and it's a greater chance. The greater chance you do something, the greater chance you're going to screw up. Isn't that right? That's the same thing, uh, same thing is true with mitosis. This is basically that simple. Okay. Uh, 1418 translocation is important. That's the one for the B cell lymphoma involving the inactivation of the suppressor gene. Those are the big mutations. Uh, there's another one. I'm blocking 1517 uh, translocation for acute progranulocytic leukemia. Anybody know what the, why they're honing in on acute progranulocytic leukemia just for fun? You can treat it with retinoic acid. You can treat it with vitamin A and cure the patient. And even ask, how does it do that? The answer is, it matures the blast. And so what is a malignant cell becomes benign. Can you imagine that treating a cancer with vitamin A? It's unbelievable. The same kind of stuff that you use for cystic acne. You could use for treating a cancer. No wonder why it's on the exam. So they ask everything about acute progranulocytic leukemia. The translocation, 1517, the treatment of retinoic acid. Every exam has it. All right. Those are the important ones, guys. All right, these are your suppressor genes. Okay? They do what they're supposed to suppress. So when we knock them off, then that means whatever they were suppressing keeps on going. Okay? Okay? So we, we already talked about RB. We talked about P53. This is the adenomatous polyposis coli. That's the one for familial polyposis. That's the suppressor gene. We have the neurofibromatosis one. That's a suppressor gene. We have the Wilms tumor one. That's a suppressor gene. We've got these dudes, BRCA1, BRCA2. Okay, BRCA1, BRCA2. Basically, both of them are involved in DNA repair. Okay, one's on chromosome 13 and one's on chromosome 17. Okay, uh, the breast cancer 2 is the one that's totally associated with breast cancers. Breast cancer 1 can be breast cancer, ovarian cancers, and others. Okay, only 15% of breast cancers have any kind of genetic relationship, so most of the time they're not genetic. But these are, they're suppressor genes. Okay, so these are the key suppressor genes over here, and those are the different diseases that we see them in. All right. Now, getting out of the molecular level and going up to another point, another, another point. Okay, we know the mechanisms of mutations, point mutations, translocations, uh, amplification, okay? We know about the proto-oncogenes can be activated by these things. We know that suppressor genes can be inactivated. Okay, who does this? Why do they do these things? Well, you know we have three main ways, chemicals, viruses, and radiation. Those are the three main ways. Okay, now, this is a trick question. Are you ready? Actually, you can figure it out. The answer will be obvious if I give it to you. Which of the three is the most common mechanism for initiating a cell, producing a mutation? How many think it's chemicals? Raise your hand. Okay, how many think it's viruses? Raise your hand. How many of you think it's uh, radiation? Raise your hand. The answer is chemicals. Guys, smoking was the most common cause of death in the United States. Polycyclic hydrocarbons are the carcinogen in smoke. It's a chemical. It's a chemical. It's even more important and more common, uh, more co often associated with cancer than uh, virus-induced cancer or even radiation-induced cancer chemicals. In fact, like 80%? <laughs> Big time. So don't forget smoking. That's the number one. Alarm. It's not just lung cancer, guys. It's mouth, screams of the mouth, larynx, lung, pancreas, bladder, lots of things. <laughs> and a lot of times it's not number one, but it's maybe number two. Cervical, colon, leukemias, Holy mackerel, that's a lot of cancer. Mm -hmm. Polycyclic hydrocarbons, you bet. Okay, so I'm just going to show you just a couple little picture things that relate to some of these things that, that, that predispose to mutations happening. This is a little papillary tumor in the bladder. 
What do you think the most common cause uh, of that is? Well, it's a transitional cancer, and what do you think the most common cause of transitional cancers are? Smoking. But what if you worked in a dye industry? What would that be? Aniline. There you go. What if you had Wegener's granulomatosis, you were put on a drug, you ended up with um, uh, hematuria. You did a cytology, and you saw some abnormal cells. What drug was the patient on? Cyclophosphamide. That's the way they would ask it, guys. I know that our little, our little English friend taught you about cyclophosphamide and hemorrhagic cystitis, okay, using Mesna to prevent that. And I know he mentioned the fact that it's also an unbelievable carcinogen for transitional cell carcinoma. So the way they ask it is they'll present a case and a person is being treated with something and have a side effect and you have to tell them what the drug is. In this case, it was cyclophosphamide. That's how they do it. Okay. All right, here's uh, lung cancer, and we're using toothpicks to hold up the main stem bronchus. And, of course, the most common cause of this is uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons from smoke. The ones, the cancers that are most often associated with smoking and main stem brand, uh, cancers are squamous and small cell. Okay, here's a virus-associated cancer. Here's a deal with nonpyritic raised red lesions. Diagnosis? Come on, come on. Coppice sarcoma, guys. Coppice sarcoma. Mech, uh, uh, virus, please. Herpes 8, not 6. Not six, that's roseola. Herpes eight. Herpes eight. That's it right there. This picture has been on many, many exams. Diagnosis. Burkitt's uh, uh, virus. Epstone Barr virus. Name some other ones with Epstone Barr virus. Nasal pharyngeal carcinoma. What group of people commonly? Chinese. Okay. Uh, liver. What about liver? Hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis B. What country? Asia because of the high incidence of hepatitis B, and then there's a certain mold in the food, name, uh, in the food named the mold, aflatoxin B. So that combination of having hepatitis B, the cirrhosis, plus the aflatoxin, that's what makes that one of the most common cancers in the Far East. Okay, so hepatitis B. Of course, C also can produce uh, uh, liver cancer, too. It's pro some people say it's the most common. Some people say it's the second. It's kind of 40-30 in terms of percentage. Most books that I've read said 40% in favor of hepatitis B and then 30% in favor of hepatitis C. Now, somebody else might tell you the opposite. It's a moot point. It's a moot point. I don't think I'd worry a whole lot about that. Okay. Here's some of the other viruses here. Okay, how about HIV? What's, I mean, uh, is that associated with any cancer? Primary CNS lymphoma. You want to know how they're going to ask that question? The rapidly increasing incidence of primary central nervous, lymphoma, central nervous system lymphoma in the United States is directly attributable to the increase in A, B, C, D, E. Answer, HIV. There you go. That's how they ask a question like that. Got it? All right. Okay. Remember also EBV for malignant lymphomas uh, other than Burkitt's as well. Uh, they can do that too. Forget HTLV1. That's not too important. Um, 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 uh, herpes 8, coppices. How about human papillomavirus? Squamous cancers, cervix, vagina, vulva, and don't forget, anus and homosexuals. Unprotected intercourse, common board question. Okay, so the same HPV, you know, 16, uh, 18, 31, that can produce cervical, vaginal, vulvar cancer. It's the same one that can produce uh, anal squamous cell carcinomas and homosexuals. Common board question. HPV. Remember how that worked? E6, E7 protein products, E6 knocks off. Uh, the P53, E7 knocks off uh, the uh, retinoblastoma. That's a pretty cool little virus there, huh? All right. Radiation. Okay, this is chronic myelogenous leukemia over here. This exact slide, the slide was on boards, according to a few students that were taking a review in New York. Okay, uh, what is the most common cancer associated with radiation? Leukemia. And the most common leukemia associated with radiation is chronic myelogenous leukemia. That's the one with the 922 translocation of what? Proto-oncogene. ABLA. ABL. Okay. Um, this is a, a papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. That's another very big one uh, for radiation induced. So if they give a history of a Anyone that had radiation in the head and neck area, and they say that they have uh, um, uh, non-tender nodular masses in the cervical region, <clears throat> that's metastatic papillary carcinoma of the thyroid related to ionizing radiation. Okay, very, very simple, straightforward question. Okay, another good one is osteogenic sarcoma. 
So in a, another way they ask things is by profession. They could say which uh, medical profession is most subject and would most likely get acute leukemia. That's the way I would ask it, and radiologists, okay, because the most common, most common uh, radiation-induced cancer is leukemia. Who's the one that works most with radiation? The radiologists, so they can ask it that way. Just like they could ask Jakob Kutzfeld disease, what radiation or what would you generally be? Neuropathologist. Okay, dealing with brains. We'd have more association with brains and the prions. See, they, they do things by, by where you work. Okay, and they can ask the question. All of these are in your notes. Thank you. Okay. All right. I was holding my breath. That's why I'm breathing so hard. Diagnosis. Basal cell carcinoma. This exact picture has been on hundreds of exams, and this is the histology. They don't, when they say basal cell, they mean it. It means it derives from the basal cell layer. Look at that. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Doesn't that look like it's just dripping off the basal cell layer? You also notice it's multifocal. Okay. Also notice it's multifocal. So what kind of radiation is this? Non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing is the bad stuff, the radiation. And what is it? Which UVB light? Is it UVA, UVB, or UVC? B. B is bad, right? What's UVC? Not UVC, UVA. Which light? Those of you that like dermatology, like the fluoresce superficial dermatophytes, okay, or find chagrin's patches and tuberous sclerosis, use Wood's light, which is called black light. That's UVA light. UVB light is the stuff that you try to protect yourself from um, getting uh, skin cancers, like basal cell, most common, squamous cell, second most common, malignant melanoma, or UVB, thymidine dimers, type of, uh, that's the mechanism of it. Okay, so this, make sure you know the basal cell relationship. Okay, here's a precursor lesion uh, for a certain cancer that's commonly seen in kind of sun exposed there. You can scrape it off and it comes back. Actinic keratosis. Okay, what's another name? Solar keratosis. And what cancer does it predispose to? Squamous. There you go. Very good. Kind of looks pearly, grayish, white. And it looks like something you just scrape off and it doesn't. <laughs> you can just see it just scrape off the thing, but it's... It's a dysplastic lesion, got squamous dysplasia, it's going to grow back. Okay, and so eventually, only about 3 or 4% of actinic keratosis becomes squamous cancer. Anybody know what heavy metal predisposes to this, please? Arsenic. Anybody know what countries experience a major increase in skin cancers related to arsenic? Bangladesh. That's going to be a board question because it's all over the news. Apparently the water supply is uh, contaminated with arsenic and all the arsenic-related cancers are increasing. That skin cancer, that's also going to probably be in time lung cancer. It's also probably in time also going to be angiosarcoma of the liver because uh, arsenic's involved in that. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a situation in a country where everyone's getting exposed to it because it's in the water. So they use current events very frequently on um, exam questions. They do. This, uh, this is a kid that had a wide eye reflex. Retinoblastoma. Chromosome, please. 13. Okay, it's sporadic and it's familial. Okay, so how many mutations does it take for a sporadic to become retinoblastoma? Two separate ones. You have to have knock one off on one of the chromosomes, 13s, and then one on the other one. Okay, how many if it's uh, autosomal dominant genetic inheritance? One. You're born with one already inactivated. All you need is one more mutation on the other chromosome, retinoblastoma. Is a white eye reflex most commonly due to Retinoblastoma, say no. No. The answer is congenital cataract is the most common cause of a white eye reflex. So don't go shining a light in a little newborn's eye and it's white and say, ah, oh, retinoblastoma. And we call on everybody and this and that. Most commonly it's due to congenital cataract, which could be due to our, some of those congenital infections like cytomegalovirus, rubella, any number of those suckers. So it doesn't mean something ho-hum, you know, something that's got to be investigated. Anybody know what drug is that predisposes to cataracts while I'm thinking about it? Why would a patient with, with Cushing's syndrome have cataracts? Corticosteroids. They predispose to cataracts. Okay. All right, let's break. We'll finish up neoplasia the next hour and start hematology probably.